Waterfronts and riverfronts. In the world's truly great cities, these are super valuable, one-of-a-kind locations. Places where you find incredible views, great recreation, dense housing, tourism, maybe too much tourism, but really, you'll find everything. For some cities, though, they're just a very convenient place to put a freeway. Eh, welcome to North America. Brace yourself, it's the 10 most offensive waterfront freeways coming up next. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation, viewer suggested topics always welcome, and you guys, I kind of get more comments than I can manage, so I don't see everything that comes my way, but you know what I always see? Comments and messages I get on Patreon. Funny how that works. This one came from a patron who lives in Columbus, Ohio, and says, I think a neat video can be focused on rivers that have been taken over by highways and interchanges. I'm not going to read this verbatim, but I will come back to it, and I really liked the idea. But I wanted to expand on it because the history of cities in the 20th century is full of battles to construct and remove waterfront freeways. So I'm going to give you my list of 10 that should be removed. But as always, a top 10 list is just a Trojan horse for my urbanist propaganda. So along the way, I'm going to give you some more philosophical thoughts on just kind of the idea of freeway removal and why we haven't done more of it. First of all, unpleasant as it sounds, let's put ourselves in the shoes of highway engineers and think about why you'd build a freeway along a coastline or a river in the first place. Well, these are places that are flat by definition, at least in places where we sighted major cities. If you're along a river or a lakefront or an oceanfront, you're not going to be building many tunnels or bridges. It's sort of the path of least resistance, which is always what you're looking for when you're trying to keep the budget under control. Well, it turns out waterfronts are also places where people like to live and work and visit. And they're great places for greenway trails for people who want to walk or bike or run. So you can see why having a freeway there could be a problem. You're putting an incredible amount of pollution, noise, and visual blight in a place where people want to congregate in large numbers and maybe even engage in aerobic activity. It's not a good combination. So let's go back to that Patreon comment. I did look at SR315. I looked at a lot of freeways this last week. Trust me, I'm ready to rinse my eyes out with Clorox. And SR315 doesn't quite make the list, but it's a good example to use to demonstrate what I'm looking for in my worst of the worst. So here's the criteria I threw into the mixer. One, property values, which aren't especially high in Columbus or anywhere in Ohio. This is important because high property values mean we're in a place with high demand where removing a waterfront freeway could free up a whole swath of developable land. Two, scenic quality. A bit subjective, but I'd say this is average or a bit below average out of everything I looked at. Three, recreational quality. And there are existing trail facilities and parks along the Olatangi. Four, proximity to downtown. Definitely this part near the interchange. Five, land uses. If there's established active industrial use, the freeway is less offensive to me. Six, size and length. SR315 doesn't have an especially wide footprint, but it does stretch all the way north of the city. And finally, permeability. If it's an elevated structure or has lots of overcrossings, I still probably want to see it taken down, but at least it's less of a barrier. We'll discuss more as we go through, but let's just get straight into it. Number 10 is the Brooklyn Queens Expressway as it passes through Brooklyn Heights. This is the shortest segment I have on my list, but it is such a high value area, and the city has invested so much in the Brooklyn waterfront in recent years that this piece of the BQE just gets more and more questionable. If you're not familiar with the location, 
The BQE here is a terrace situation with the northbound lanes a tier above the southbound lanes with expensive neighborhoods above and Brooklyn Bridge Park below. So it's a topographically challenging area, but with those views, it's incredibly high value land and you could really improve access to the park and the greenway below with like some Hong Kong style escalators or a cool funicular. Do it. Number nine is I-91 in Hartford, Connecticut. Obviously, this is not as high value an area as Brooklyn Heights from a pure dollar per square foot perspective, but man, this is a shameful dereliction of your downtown riverfront. Big interchanges too. A riverfront should be a major urban amenity, and instead it's just squandered here. There's a sculpture park and a river walk, but how pleasant can it possibly be when you've got a 10 lane freeway sewer right up against it? Quick disclaimer on this whole list. This is an interstate and Harvard doesn't really have a bypass or a beltway. So it's not clear which other freeway you could designate as I-91 in order to tear this one out. Not saying that means you shouldn't do it, but this channel is pragmatic. And just being real, you'd need a more holistic study of just about any freeway on this list to make sure you aren't creating any unintended consequences. Number eight is I-5 on the east bank of the Willamette River in Portland, Oregon. You know, Portland always comes up in success stories of freeway removal because they took out Harbor Drive, which ran on the west or downtown side of the Willamette. But that didn't happen until they built the Markham Bridge and I-5 on the East River front, which were completed in 1966. And the Fremont Bridge and I-405 along the west edge of downtown completed in 1973. 1974 is the year they closed Harbor Drive, so is that a success story? I don't know. They literally needed to build two new freeways to close just one. Anyway, the central east side has gradually been shifting from industrial use to residential and commercial in the last couple of decades. The East Bank Esplanade was completed in 2001, and I-5 is just more and more of an albatross. It's just gotta go. Number seven is I-580 along the East Bank of San Francisco Bay, running through a variety of East Bay jurisdictions. Look, I don't know the precise property value of this area, let alone how much it would increase if you took out this eyesore freeway, but this is one of the most expensive places to live on the planet. Imagine what you could do with this land and the access you could provide to public space that has some pretty incredible views. Having a 10 lane freeway running at grade here is contrary to just about any reasonable land use or urban planning principle I can possibly think of. Number six is the Gardner Expressway in Toronto. This is not nearly as bad as it could be since plans to extend it east were scuttled and some proposed widenings were never implemented, but it's still pretty awful. Particularly considering the kind of development intensity the city has along the lakefront. I know I have a lot of Toronto viewers, so let me know what the latest conversations are around taking down the expressway. Because I know the ideas are out there and sadly, I'd expect this kind of thing to happen in Canada before it happens in the US. Bonus Golden Horseshoe content. Queen Elizabeth Way in Hamilton and Points East is also extremely bad. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say, if Vancouver can get by without freeways, Hamilton, Ontario can do it too. Number five is I-25 in Denver. For a place that routinely shows up on lists of America's healthiest and most livable cities, this is sort of a crime against all Denverites. This is the South Platte River, which should be the crown jewel greenbelt of the whole city. And there's a lot here. Trails, cultural attractions, shopping districts, but a lot of it is just a 10 lane freeway with ginormous interchanges. Look, I love a riverfront greenway for biking or running, but if I'm huffing and puffing at a mile altitude, that's a lot of dust and debris and who knows what coming out of the exhaust. Carbon monoxide, benzene, just assorted toxic crap going straight into your bloodstream. Is it too far to say that allowing freeways right next to active transportation facilities is 
public health malpractice. So that just said it. Four is I-64 and I-71 in Louisville, Kentucky. This is a city I'm very fond of, but we haven't spent nearly enough time talking about the shockingly dismal freeway situation in downtown Louisville. It's got one of the truly unsightly downtown interchanges in the free world, and a riverfront that's almost completely cordoned off from the rest of the city. And it's a riverfront with tons of potential. Cool, old-timey paddle steamers, of course. But it really has the bones for a great riverfront promenade, with a connection to one of the coolest bike ped-only bridges in the U.S. The Big Four Bridge over the Ohio River. Great city and so much potential, just waiting to be unleashed. Okay, more to come, and while you're pondering what could possibly be worse than what we've already seen, shudder. Consider liking this video, unless you think waterfront freeways are awesome. Subscribe and hit the bell to get notified of similarly mind-numbing content every Wednesday at noon Pacific. Consider connecting on the apps, and or supporting the channel directly if you want to keep this operation financially solvent. And sub count check, the channel now has enough subscribers to fill Tiger Stadium, home of the Tigers, from Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge. I feel like I'm just counting down SEC stadiums at this point. I don't really have anything to say about this one, other than this is a lot to invest in a venue that hosts like eight games a year. Honorable mentions would be, I don't know, just cities that have torn down their waterfront freeways. I mentioned Portland, which gets an asterisk in my book. And you've got San Francisco, where the Embarcadero Freeway was dismantled after it took earthquake damage, and it wasn't replaced in any real way. Then in Seattle, you had demolition of the Alaskan Way Viaduct, which was also damaged by an earthquake. This should give you a sense of the level of event that has to happen before anyone considers removing a freeway. And even then it's not that straightforward since the viaduct was replaced by a crazy expensive tunnel that apparently not very many people want to pay to use, and a pretty wide surface street. Anyway, there's a lot of contention around all of these and they're fascinating stories. Dishonorable mention to Philadelphia. I didn't feel like I-76 or I-95 were quite atrocious enough to make the top 10, but it's pretty embarrassing to have two different rivers blockaded by interstates. Also, dishonorable mention to the entire state of North Carolina. All of the major cities are inland, and none of them are on rivers of any size, apparently. How does that even happen? Geography nerds, weigh in down in the comments. And before we get back to it, a little editorializing. Knowing what we know today about building walkable, dense, mixed-use communities in central locations, and knowing what we know about the correlation between proximity to freeways and things like childhood asthma rates, cancer rates, and cardiovascular diseases, I'd have to say, and maybe I'm an optimist, but you wouldn't see that many urban freeways get built if we were starting from scratch today. So the way I see it is, urban freeways are bad land use decisions that are grandfathered in because political inertia is a thing and removing freeways is expensive and disruptive. It really calls for a federal solution and the Reconnecting Communities program in the 2021 Infrastructure Bill was a step in the right direction, but it's underfunded like at least 10,000 X. So when you get a chance to support a political candidate, support one that'll go all in on funding something like Reconnecting Communities. Okay, and Soapbox. Number three is Storo Drive and Soldiers Field Road in Boston. This one is not an interstate, so maybe it's less of a political lift, but it runs from the Charles River Dam near North Station downtown, all the way down the Charles, past the city limits. The Esplanade and the bike path should be a great way to connect between downtown, the Back Bay, and destinations like BU, but the freeway really hinders connectivity, and it's just noise and pollution that blights the overall experience. You've already got I-90 running east-west, so what's this even for? 
Number two is FDR Drive in Manhattan. This thing stretches all the way from the I-95 bridge in Washington Heights down to the Battery, defacing practically the entire east edge of Manhattan. Just an extremely valuable chunk of real estate. The views over the East River are lovely where they exist, but there's not nearly enough. The saving grace, the thing that keeps FDR Drive from being number one, is that it does have elevated and underground sections, so the permeability is okay for a freeway. Still though, we got rid of the west side elevated highway, after it started collapsing anyway. So let's see some of that can-do New York attitude and get rid of this monstrosity too. And number one is Lakeshore Drive in Chicago. Like the last two, it sounds like it could be some sort of tree-lined boulevard. Eh, it's a drive, not a freeway. But make no mistake, outside of a short segment where it runs through Millennium and Grant Parks, it's a freeway. What puts Lakeshore Drive over the top is just the land use. A fantastic green belt of beaches and parks up and down the shore on the east side of the roadway and tons of density and great views on the west side. It runs practically the length of the city, almost all at grade, as if to maximize the noise, the air pollution, and the physical barrier from the lakefront. There is the occasional tunnel under the freeway. I don't know who's gonna be excited about using that. Chicagoans weigh in. Does the existence of Lakeshore Drive bother you? Or have you just kind of convinced yourself it's not that bad? I'm interested in hearing from people who have to live with it. Ugh. Okay, that was tough. If that was hard to watch for you, imagine what it was like to research and write it. Roll the credits. Thanks for joining today, and thanks to the patrons for making this a borderline realistic vocation. Keep the great topic suggestions coming. I'll be back with a brand new installment next week, and I'll see you then.